come to the door and walk around. Uh, welcome to the Dead Spirit. This is Tyler Pettibus. Thank you, Brad. Sure, I'll be back. Yes, 50th anniversary. Uh, the program is Cameron Off by Yourself. In November of 1957, as a young boy, I remember it very well. I remember looking out to the sky and seeing the blinking red light passing over the hill. It struck fear to the countless inhabitants. The watch is pleasant. And uh, the space race began, a period of unprecedented investment and research. Bad science education in this country results in the development of new technologies and advancement of innovation. For the next 50 years, the United States became a world leader in science and technology, expedition, research, and most importantly, innovation and entrepreneurship. These efforts fueled our economy and allowed each generation of Americans to inherit a better standard of living. And their parents. And as a father of a seven year old, I feel fear that our children could be the first generation of Americans that will not inherit a living standard better than their parents and the birth of the nation of uh, America again. And let me explain why. Sputnik showed us that we were not the world's technological leader. Today, with rapid economic and technological advances in other countries, I fear we are now on the cusp of another Sputnik. I fear that our country has coasted on the investment of information for the last 50 years, or what my father would say, the cookie in our secret. Now is the time to act, and I believe this committee has an important role to play in helping tie our country back as a technological leader in the world. Soon after the launch of Sputnik in March of 1958, this committee was established to face the challenges presented by the space sectors. We will direct the work of the Center that challenges today remain the same. To secure our country's international promise in the areas of innovation and technological development. The witness before us today leads those in action. Bill Gates embodies both the American spirit of innovation and the theological virtue of charity. He has built arguably the most successful technological company in the world, and then has turned his financial success into a gift to our society. On this occasion, the 50th anniversary of this committee, as we reflect back on the technological advances of the past and look ahead to the challenges facing our country's competitors in the world, I can think of no better witness, a better center, a better position to help share his insights with this committee. As I said before, I'm very pleased by the work done by this committee over the past year to develop and shape improved targets for the Americans in the Peace Center. This legislation is necessarily an important first step in making the commitments needed to bring our country back to technological promise. As both the passing of the Computers Act, authorized authorization of threats of space, we now have to follow up to be sure we have stellar funding. I look forward to hearing Mr. Gates on other efforts needed to build our strength and get ready to work for another 50 years. It's my hope that we will continue to work for ways to embrace the global marketplace and not shy away from the challenges that we face. Before I conclude, I want to quickly acknowledge the presence of two members of the House and past chairman of the committee, uh, Mr. Bob Walker of the end of the mayor, and Sherry Bill. Welcome back. And we have another chairman, uh, Mr. Cesar Bill, uh, who just came in and is the work with us. Thank you, Cesar Bill. I hope all is well there. Uh, this uh, gives us another extended member of our committee. I'm pleased that you were able to join us today and help us commemorate this 50th anniversary of the committee. With that, I would like to now recognize Mr. Hall for his opening statement. Dear everyone, thank you. A special thank you to Mr. Gates for joining us this morning to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Science and Technology Committee, this committee. And I want to also take the time to say hello to my good friends, Bob Kelly, Mark Olson, and Sherry Bell, and of course, and Mayor Gable for being the chairman. We have not abandoned the men and women of America who are raised to step forward for the challenges we face. Take authority of this assembly line this session as the first milestone that can get back in the town to pick up on the perspective. But don't you take next year's World War II as the last of God to be invented. But it's the one World War II event for today. The one set in a record four days. It was not totally on the front stop that age and hired on to pay their civil civil stop to do what I would today, Mr. Chairman, one who gave the next amendment would be down the road and shut out imagination and brought about a revolution in communication that changed the world. His foundation turned revolution on its head, saw something learned from the hundreds of failures and others who ran the world. And let me tell you, when we're done, it's not your presence. I think it's important for us to 
great financial success, Mr. Davis has grown on this. He and his wife, Melinda, have undertaken to fight a few challenges on making our world a better place. Are you doing the same entrepreneurial spirit that is to encourage businessmen everywhere to judge the majority of his fortune to one of the billion dollars to send them down down to the city? Again, we're very pleased to have you here and we look forward to the testimony of this guy and other like the new York executive in Washington, Mr. Davis. Mr. Gates, I just want to visit Brian Marks and tell him once again how much we admire what you've done for our state and for the world. Mr. Gates, you're from Mount Sinai this morning on the committee of the Tennessee. He's so proud of what you have done and what you're doing for the future. And Mr. Gates just mentioned what a great group of science committee you've got here on this committee. We need to keep it that much more. Yes, I told you we are a bipartisan committee of farmers that Chair Bowman is a good example, and we're fortunate to have also have a Democrat and a Republican in Washington State. And Mr. Rogers here is uh, uh, under the House for uh, many times. A very good and very credible person, I'm sure he's still here. Excuse me, back on this committee. Mr. Rogers here. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Gates. Thank you so much for being here today. We are, uh, we are excited to hear your testimony, and uh, I'm just going to take a moment to say I'm very, very happy. Thank <laughs> you. 
and they're trying to kill him and succeed and have not success. He makes no sense for him to keep, keep going in the worst things. Out comes Hans and Hans trying to justify his faith. And then insists that they return home. The U.S. innovation has always been based in part on the contribution of foreign born scientists and researchers. For example, a recent survey uh, conducted by Southern University showed that between 1995 and 2005, Startups with at least one foreign born founder created 450,000 new U.S. jobs. However, as a recent study uh, shows, for every employee holding that technology companies hire, five additional jobs are created around that person. But as you know, our immigration system makes it very difficult for U.S. firms to hire highly skilled foreign workers. Last year, at Microsoft, we were unable to obtain for over a third of our foreign born candidates. An example is the story of Arkeem Ubrani, a talented young man who graduated from the University of Toronto. He graduated in 2006 and he offered him a job, and he has not been able to obtain an H1B visa for two straight years, and therefore he sent his job out. He's exactly the type of science and engineering graduate that we need to continue to add jobs there are a number of steps that Congress and the White House could take to address this problem, including an extension of the period for foreign students to work here after graduation, increasing the current cap on h one visas, clearing a path to permanent residency for high skilled foreign born employees, eliminating per country income limits, and significantly increasing the annual number of green cards. I want to emphasize that to address the shortage of scientists and engineers, we must do both. Reform our education system and our immigration policy. In New York, American companies simply, simply will not have the talent they need and ability to compete. Finally, we must increase our investments in basic science and engineering skills. In the past, federally funded research spark industries that today provide hundreds of thousands of jobs. Even though we know that basic research drives economic progress, real federal spending on research has fallen since 2005. I urge Congress to increase funding for basic research by 10 percent annually for the next seven years. I fully support Congress's, Congress's efforts to fund basic research through the America Competes Act. The country is at a crossroads. For decades, innovation has been our engine of prosperity. Now, economic progress has more than ever been in danger. Without leadership from Congress and the President to commit to political policies like the ones I've outlined today and the commitment of the private sector to do its part, the center of progress can shift to other nations that are not committed to the pursuit of innovation. I want to conclude on it, again, congratulating the committee on its 50th anniversary and to thank you for this opportunity to share my perspective. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have on these topics. Thank you, Mr. Gates. I know you're about ready for about six, five, five minutes. I went to a wedding to a little of the OECD around the end of uh, the end of the fourth column. He was asking about how much cash he gets in the room. And the thing that he could bring in the country is that he has sense, as usual, to get there by a very poor thing. And I was trying to break the topic on a uh, very kind of spelling that it almost uh, is overhauling uh, the whole pension system here in Germany, which is also overhauling the whole capability to get free uh, on cash increases. And I was trying to you know, get caught around you know, what it takes to get there. And uh, they uh, sort of emphasize that they want to have a national standard, but they want to have a contract in essence with the states, the parents, and uh, the students to uh, work and what is the best way to get there. So it doesn't just work by the money. And it's a new testimony. And let me say that this hurts all the lives that could get into that. Uh, and Mr. Gates uh, uh, showed this testimony, but it really is. Uh, uh, this full testimony can be on our website. Www.housesellingcapital.com, and uh, it 
to the woodwind and things that I can get back and start on that. But I can't keep up with the animation the way you do for the animated film style that this is the case. It would be a lot of work for me to say the thing. Uh, and, and, and it looks to me, we talked about secondary effects. You talked about transparency. Uh, you talked about having a table full of data and having those formats and rough edges to impact and uh, making uh, decisions. And, and honestly, the topic of national uh, scope. And, and, and this is, I want to see if you can help me get through this, is that I teach a family for concern that we have this national sense of uh, having to teach the kids and don't think in terms of the paper. Uh, from what you've seen and studied and around the world, how do you pass and guide uh, on standards so that you can uh, measure teacher students and, and, and their success? Versus um, the problem of just teaching to the test. The, the tests, what is it? Are the fundamental skills, uh, math skills, reading skills, and these are exactly the qualifications that employers are interested in uh, people having. And if you look at the other nations that you run a piece of, they're very serious about. Doing tests as a metric and, and looking at individual teachers and schools and systems based on how the test results are uh, uh, coming into the data. The United States and Pizza were actually among the best at the fourth grade level. Uh, we're in the middle of the eighth grade. It's only by senior year that we drop to the bottom of those results. And so clearly in the high school period, there's some level of rigor that exists in these other nation systems that isn't as strong in our system. Uh, the background of the teachers, the current techniques. And so we would say that data that looks at these results and learning from that data is of, of great importance. Um, in fact, there is funding uh, for these data systems that are uh, part of the uh, American Competes. We are gathering more data as a country. That's a great thing. Now, there's a tendency when that data doesn't come out well that is say, okay, here's the problem. It is it. And even a temptation to say, if the data is so bad, let's stop testing because it's really depressing to keep looking at, at these numbers. In fact, the amount of adjustments by the pixel studies is very high because some problem where you have at the you know, local, state, and federal level the resources to do those things. But uh, you know, I don't think uh, you'll see the, the availability of the data and understanding that data that is the, the right way to go. You know, when you mention depressing, what is, I think, the most depressing about data is the our students in elementary will really turn out pretty well. And at the middle school, not very well. And it's just by the lack of data uh, in high school. And, and I think what we're talking about is not quite, it is just a lot of elite uh, EHDs. Uh, the Brian Innsbruck from the high school graduate, the Jimmy Cobb, the Colonel Jack, has been looking at how it's going to the level. And if you look into it, what we found uh, was that uh, at the middle school level, 63% uh, of ag teachers now knew that certification and teaching ag for uh, the ag and ag related uh, matters that you're seeking for your kids' teachers are coming to certification every year. So it's hard to be able to teach something you don't have a clear background in. Data. That's one thing we want to try to do at uh, Age Peace. Uh, I can tell you and the heart of the country is to be excited that the, the sun and I start to break the words, and I think school law starts with the teachers, and we want to try to be a better school teacher. And I looked over your resume. I noticed uh, we were, oh, I got a little bit of a head start. We were summer contemporaries until today. Uh, and I tried to get a little bit of uh, uh, a book dancing later. So I may have given up too many head jobs in this. So I was trying to make a comment. You may have seen it. I noticed that you were pretty good in the art lab. I noticed that I'm a college graduate and you're not. Uh, but I also noticed that you worked on state and local level. And I suspected uh, a little bit of sales to Diana in making sure that she gets the best education that she can be able to compete in the beautiful land of the national level, very much the international level. And, and, you know, some people say your first request to us is probably not first to Dr. Moore. Uh, outside of uh, uh, the, this 
to experience it. The truth is, I'm going to bring it to you. You want to have a little bit of time to be here for you. We're going to stay here. We're going to have a seminar here. We're going to have a chance to be able 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 to Thank you. 
particular person that gets a few minutes and they are the broader question about standards and quality, about um, uh, things like open access, if that's what they want, that standards, uh, international standards for the internet, um, the, the pros and cons of all that, we're going to see those things. But then you guys, that is an important area because we're building up more and more records um, that you want to be out in the round sense of the field. You want to be able to preserve those records over a period of time. In fact, these uh, digital archives will cover uh, a lot of people's activities, and you know, parents will want to be able to go back and get uh, essays from children, or researchers will want to be able to go back and get the data that, uh, that they're going to experiment. So even libraries will want to write to our teachers in this digital format access that. Um, Microsoft is very engaged in the standards process. Uh, there's a, a new standard that's being put in front of the International Standards Organization called Open XML. And it uses XML in a, in a way that means that anybody using uh, our software, or other software that meets the standard, will be able to access it uh, um, in the future. So it's very important to us that uh, Open XML become an ISO standard so that uh, families and researchers and other ar archivists worldwide will be able to access information from the past and use it to interact in the future. And it's by mining data like this uh, that I think a, a lot of the advances in understanding how education, a style of understanding, which has been in the, the medical field. Uh, so it's, it's a, both an important thing for innovation and an important thing for citizens to, to have access to information. Okay, I appreciate that answer, but I mean, there are lots of other library outlets you find your list to the CPM format, and you can, if I remember, a chance to get notes up on my grants that I could go find on the CPM machine, and they have my grant forms come back to the school back to the library, and that's one of the things we're going to But, you know, I think the first one that they were like, well, I'd like to talk with leadership in this area, and just the whole issue of standards. One of the issues on, on this one is that I, I particularly want to talk about your company, Andy, is I hear from constituents, hey, wait a second, why are we only four of us from the international trade, either stay or come into our country? Shouldn't we be getting more engaged there? And, and, and Microsoft has really been a leader in that area. So we, we always expect to benefit from Microsoft's leadership. One of the thoughts that I've taken on that is, is there a way we should, I know there's a small fee for H1B visa. Is there a way we should actually ask companies to put maybe a little more skin in the game than you would if you left like your internships or other things? In other words, if you're applying for an H1B uh, um, position and you got your company, then your company must demonstrate that you're a true stable works company if you want that job. But many companies, I don't think, have followed the example of Microsoft. So what are the pros and cons of that? How might we make that work? Because that government, like 
wasn't really close to God, but the A students were A students for Katie. That's what I was saying. A students, the two of them, the two of them are the end of the day. That's right. And, and what I said there is that when you bring in this work problem here, we create jobs around them. And if we don't, so with the B and C students, are the ones who get those jobs around this type of community. And they just stop the demand for forced work, saying, hey, yeah, we will hire the B and C students from in, we'll work around them. Yeah. But according to business plan, we have done almost 150,000 computer programs that lost their jobs in this country since the year 2000. Now, my reading of those cases is that there are plenty of people out there to hire them. But they do not have the top quality people to dig in and try to help out elsewhere. And we only work with 750,000 Americans in the United States business. I don't just go on any point. Actually, business week doesn't do surveys. I think you're referring to a poll that business week probably on the next time there's a study. What is business week? Yeah, yeah there's a poll. It's not a poll the next week, but there's a study that a group of business leaders did. Okay. And they beat with Boston to us to find what an engineer did. When we say that these jobs are created, we're in, we're in business every day. We're not kidding about it. These jobs are going created, and the result is that in a competitive economy, we're going to have less wages. No, no, we have to have to be able to create these jobs. We're going to have to be less wages. Now, you know, and, and no, we, we, okay, it's not an issue of rates and wages. We, these jobs are very, very, very high paying jobs. Now, we are hiring as many of these people as we can. Let me give you an economic example. Mr. Rebecca, if I can give you an example of how you can on the same round. I was in California on a pilot and I was working on a pilot and I was going to post over the Bay and go to the Bay and come back to the Bay. And they had a big event there and the reception was wonderful and they were going to have a big event there. And I said, I'm sure he's excited to be going to the Bay. of science that we have today, teaching computers uh, to see, teaching them to hear, um, the kind of modeling of the world that's very important for all the um, energy challenges we face and the, the kind of software we need to make college breakthroughs. You know, I think that it's, it's more exciting even now than it is 
So here's what your water usage will help you make in an empty crate. Um, you know, we just took the one by group. Um, we remind people historically only had access to a few books that many years after they were available were put into Braille. You know, today, because of speech synthesis, you can't really use the built in Braille software. Blind people can browse the internet and have the same access to information that, that you have. And to me, you know, there's just dozens of different examples of things like that where technologies have empowered people to work in new ways. And in some ways, it's less abstract to think that uh, you know, going to the booth and people can meet those people and talk about how their life has changed. Or you can look at, at diseases and you have a big program and see uh, what impact that's having. Advances in biology and information technology are absolutely the reason why we can be optimistic that in the next generation, whether it's the diseases of the poor countries or uh, diseases that are, are prevalent here, we're very likely to have breakthroughs in virtually all of those things. Uh, that didn't mean that I think there aren't so many good things that, that can be brought to the science. I have to admit, it's a surprise to me how few things could proceed with the field. industry in my state of Arizona um, depends a lot on um, our ability to recruit and retain scientists and mathematicians. Scientific exports in the ITAC field totaled about almost $9 billion in 2006, which was a, it's an increase of almost $2 billion from 2005. We have a lot of high-tech clusters, particularly in southern Arizona, and you know, I personally think there are resources to do so. Is, I think that's really the, the key. I think at the University of Arizona, Arizona State University, um, Northern Arizona University, they're not producing enough students. But so, if I ask you, you mentioned this earlier in your testimony, aggressively, what can our country do to compete with other specific nations around the world to make sure that we can retain the students who want to come here and they're the best and the brightest from, from wherever they come from? And, um, and then have them be part of this. this work that we're doing for thinking in Arizona State. For me, there are some things that come from process that they can do, and I'm certain from the process that, that are going to them. But at the end of the day, the, by far the key thing I have is that people that cannot stay work there. That is the background on uh, green cards uh, is, is longer than ever. The dental and DD system was by far the worst this year, right in the first day they were on. So anybody who graduated it didn't couldn't even be part of the process because they didn't have their degree and have that good degree to get into the into the pool. I will say that this this is an issue that the technology industry has a very strong consensus that it's their best account. So you take an employer like Intel, uh, who is very uh, present in in Arizona. They depend at the top of their research activity on having the very first scientists. So they know things up like Microsoft, where if they, if they get those, they create the, the manufacturing plant and hit, the reach out and uh, get fairly substantial numbers. And they, it's easier for them to recite those activities here in, in the United States. Did you ask your question now? Uh, what is it that your physicists thought about the biology that you went to? Scientists and engineers, so many of them are 
and I'm as much as the scientific and engineering groups I encourage them to visit the nearest school uh, where I'm trying to speak to the classes and then go to college and to students in the future to design laboratories to work with us uh, with their civil engineering and the nearest high school building things like that uh, many years ago students were not good students on the ground the government kind of screwed it up by the fact that scientific communities to interact with the students at risk. I always interact with them and I don't to speak to high schools. Uh, most of the students don't know much about my background, uh, but I'm, you know, I tell them I'm a nerd. Uh, they sort of disbelieve me until I show them my best to try to get them to learn. But I also tell them in high school that it's a very important choice to make. Uh, the right choice will determine whether uh, somebody will be a nerd or working for me, and they have to make the choice between me and what I'm working for them. What are the tools that I can work with them to find their six figure salaries in high school? I, I totally agree with the comment you made, and I, I, I hope that the Peter Foundation and the Marvin Schmidt Foundation, uh, both through the foundation that they work with them on, on this problem that I learned at the end of the second year of studies, uh, the comments you made on about the pension and Somehow we have to get the, you know, the picture changed in America. I find it fascinating, for example, that surveys of parents, uh, the parents will say, yes, we want more than math and science in our schools. And when you ask them about their school that their kids are in, they say, oh, our school is fine. They just don't have the answer that I would tell them. And I appreciate those comments, and I have it. I know that they do a great job in working with American school boards. The teachers, in my experience, and I went through a lot of teachers, I never met any that have not had a proper education in science or math. They have not been taught how to teach it correctly. But they are great at every degree and very good at teaching it well. So they're really concentrating my efforts on the professional development programs. But I'm interested in ideas you might have about other ways that we get our business and government together in a way that can actively be Students who are far behind, but they're lucky enough to have that teacher, they can be brought all the way up to the level of average. But the difference of having a good teacher is very, very dramatic. And yet, in terms of figuring out what those things are and how students are able to make these use of data and arrive at, I'd say we are way behind other, other countries in, in uh, uh, being able to do that. Thank you. 
sit on that and kind of rewrite it for you. Not that it's hard to do it if you're doing the right trade-offs that you can, but it's just some of the systems where you really used to make hard changes. It's, it's taking place, and we're seeing very, very quick results in that type of structure. But you know, I'm not going to buy anything like that. I'm buying this. And he was trying to go to the market and you know, do the exercises that we had done before. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Gates, for appearing this morning. Uh, I want to say that I appreciate your innovation, your technical innovation, and your work, and the generosity with uh, the presentation and your time. Uh, one of the things I, I'm really concerned about is how to inspire the next generation. And what do you think the state should do? I mean, uh, some of the other members have talked about uh, the, uh, the Russian sideline and the uh, speaker back asked about the next big thing. What do you think we can do as a state to actually inspire our kids to take advantage of what education is being offered? The my idea really that a kid is to have teachers who want to prove it and to make the subject engaging. And I think that's where you see a big difference um, is you know, does the subject really come to life in a very strong way? If you have up to our university systems, they are the right things are happening. I mean, these universities compete for talent, they bring people to each other. They compete for taking research funding, they compete for students, and that's why I get vibrancy in uh, these top universities is when they can incur such a big asset. They don't do that in terms of maximizing um, you know, that, that kind of contribution. They don't have it in the other levels of the system. And, you know, so um, one, of the, one of the, the tools that's been used in many states is type approaches where you can experiment and you give teachers uh, you know, some more freedom in terms of how they do things and try out new approaches. And that's you know, maybe a lot of where the innovation is coming from is those different you know, new types of schools. But I'm um, still, you know, I am amazed at how the numbers in science and engineering are going down. That, um, and, and that is not for the age of the numbers. I mean, not for the age that they're going down and going up. It's all the way, there's no rich country, assuming you take Korea uh, out of the picture, that all, Europe and the U.S. are experiencing the same phenomenon of less and less students going into uh, science and, and technology. So there's no simple upper policy, you know, the variety of policies that are used. There's no simple policy thing that gets mindset in front of it. Uh, the, I think there's going to be some sort of social transformation in terms of the way we view engineering and science. So, uh, I think that is going to help us inspire that generation to be very deeply appreciative, uh, especially as soon as your foundation is going to establish STEM uh, experiences at the secondary level. Can you describe the criteria of uh, the, I'm sorry, the curriculum of the schools uh, in terms of what subjects uh, STEM differs from the uh, normal school? Yeah, the, there's two things there. One is to take the curriculum that you take on the normal schools and try and make it more approachable. And the other is that they actually have specific schools um, that are designed from the beginning and have STEM excellence. And so there's a number of things uh, that's a program in Ohio, a program in Texas, a lot of these uh, uh, charter schools in different cities where they really thematically decide that they're going to bring the students into science and make some projects and make the traditional boundary of biology is different than chemistry, is different than math, uh, that they, they uh, break across those boundaries to take some project activity to make it uh, clear to the student why they should learn a little bit of math or a little bit of chemistry or biology able to achieve something very interesting. And in the, the best of these schools, there are a number of kids, including women and minorities, who are going in first in math and science. It's more than double what we have in the traditional public schools. So there is, there is some good data that says by changing the curriculum, you can start to take the drop off of interest, which is very pronounced at the high school level, and uh, step back to some degree. 
this takes place. You know, some of the trends, you know, as a researcher, you have sort of black and scared, we are still uh, preparing all the questions in the lead on this. And Microsoft is spending over $7 billion in R&D uh, in the next year. We're one of the biggest R&D spenders, and they speak very openly about what a great investment that would take for us to get the, the risk and research part of it in the way we successful, except maybe not so much in the case of our energy and nuclear technology, which I know I had wondered if you had any suggestions for us to, to talk to you and maybe on advanced energy technology down the line in some way. But it may be a foundation to pick up for the mitigation work too. Well the energist of it if I might say that and there is certainly going to be a shift Some aspects of energy that we that are so, I suppose, but so long term, you can't expect the private sector by itself to pull this off the top. And I do think that new approaches to nuclear, if you look at something like geothermal, um, some of these areas could, the private sector, some point, step in. We're in a, a really ironic situation right now. So the way that some, some things were subsidized right now are probably not the most efficient use of dollars to cause these energy changes to take place. And that, that's a, a very urgent um, thing. You know, I think we can back across the various possibilities of what might be to take place for this to do a much better job of spreading out the, the energy usage from the beginning. Uh, the 
terms of doing things like the basic really focus that Microsoft now is doing is on um, highly skilled people. And what's like about that is that you start a child with a significant benefits of over a hundred thousand dollars a year. And the policy that uh, Canada, for example, now is says that if a company is offering somebody a job at that type of salary level, that they will facilitate the person coming into the company. I also suggest that if somebody's educated at U.S. universities, that because of the recent funding that comes out of the government, that you basically subsidize that education, I think that there should be a direct path to permanent residency for I don't understand how my eyes to go so I'm going to shoot that hand up and say, well, because it's a guarantee that they're going to sell the education for any country, regardless of IQ or education, which is what I get. Uh, the, the position Microsoft takes is really focused on a, a very high, highly qualified set of people that the numbers in total would make a huge difference in terms of their work and where they think. And, and so Microsoft has to take a position on that. On the broad issue, you know, I happen to be, uh, think that immigration has been a great thing for the country, and that, you know, if you look at larger rich countries, they're facing overall population declines. This country is one of the few that, because of immigration, is actually the population will grow. I, you know, I don't know what it would be like if you didn't have have limits. There may be need for limits. I'm not an expert on this. I want to apologize. I don't want to push on the right part of the question for me. It's my happiness that's going to be. I know that there's a different kind of socialization that it brings now on the web and uh, uh, computers. And I have a fundamental understanding for arguments about the value of them and their own rate. But I'd like to answer something real quick. I'm going to be cautioning those who are struggling with either a bug in this world. Uh, about how best to get the, how to get the best out of the internet, yet not uh, have sacrificed something that's human, that makes us human, that makes us the best, enhances the best of our human. But I'm assuming that you know, whatever new technology is coming out, that parents have a legitimate concern about how it's being used, and that if the internet has been high, high on the, the list there, is a lot of us who haven't quite gotten into the toughest years in terms of having uh, you know, Facebook accounts, especially now it's come out of China, it's messaging, and I'm, I'm sure that's a gap. You know, we tend to keep our computers at home on in the open so that at least the kids are doing things on the computer they know that they can watch and cry at any point. But by doing it that way, we have avoided having to have uh, lots of the way of coming in and seeing what kids are crying or specific things where kids are embarrassed and seeing what's going on and talking about what those things are. And there are definitely are things where parents need to stay involved in understanding how their kids are spending their time, including their time on the, on the internet. There's some amazing things out there in terms of courses and materials, but I also think that um, there could be misuses in terms of information is shared and uh, how, how the kid is prioritizing their time. And also, I'm, I'm you know, going to always have an awareness of what my kids are doing um, in school. Thank you so much, Tom. It's been an honor to engage you and my attention to that. I hope you'll let me know that you can figure it out there so we can tell us something before we say that we're going to make it a Mr. Rock from uh, Rocky from Washington State is with us. Uh, so I have one of the problems with being in Boston with respect to the questions, and I have a question that I really don't have a specific. I have a couple of burning questions on a lot of um, the burning to the end. There's a maybe it's a question about the collapse of the global economy, and uh, uh, the whole market of the data, where you can goes uh, a quick tax from there on a lot of the companies. Thank 
it's it's important to look at how tax policies are influencing corporate behavior. Um, and in the case, in the case of Microsoft, um, so if we get to the higher end of that ship, you know, I think it's about a lot about the you know, overall our balance that we prefer to do our our IT care. And that's despite the fact that there's very attractive tax um, advantages that are being offered in other places. That is, even though the taxes are higher here, they're still um, within the range of you know, what, what's reasonable given the other benefits uh, that are provided. Um, on tax policy, on a new tax credit, it would be a, a very top priority to make sure that other countries aren't getting ahead of us too much in terms of the headlines that they, they provide in that area. So tax, tax policy does make a difference, uh, but you know, companies will, will, will want to be able to just go to a place that's, that's um, more advantageous. I think the comparison, uh, the U.S. still has a, a lot of things that are very much in their favor. And the U.S. certainly has been an important question in some of the things that folks are talking about. Some of the investments that came out of the private sector um, came out of the, of the semi-private sector. That is, AT&T through their laboratories is a highly regulated business. So one of the things they, they sort of did in return was do a, a lot of research that they weren't receiving a direct economic return for, but it was one of their great contributions to the country and to the world. And as they became more and more typical private company, as it was broken up into the various pieces, the liberty they had to take profits and fund research largely went away. So the net of R&D spending coming out of the end proceedings of what was the net system is quite a bit less than it was in the past. There's also cases of companies uh, like Sean who weren't quite as adept at taking their research work and themselves benefiting from it by prioritizing it the way that they had expected. And so that that was a time period too. And in fact, when Microsoft 15 years ago tried to went in to make pure research very rare, we wanted to make sure we were going to not only benefit society but also be able to get the top talent. But I can say that that's worked extremely well for us. We are a good advocate uh, when talking with private companies that there are ways of running a research uh, budget that means that you get very, very high return for that work. You know, just last week we had TechFest where our research was sort of the world dollar of the year. So if you're looking at that's really the most fun thing during the entire year is to see that kind of research work. So there are, there are methods, there are best practices that the private sector needs to spread that will build the confidence that those investments are, are in the right direction. Yeah, you know, one of those companies that have succeeded in order to share your viewpoints on the business now is that other companies doing the same thing and showing that direction. Yes, the, well, another sector that's been incredibly R&D intensive is the um, drug industry. And, you know, the agriculture is facing some challenges in terms of the So hopefully we'll get into a period with other advances and encouragement that they're giving will get them back into increasing their R&D budgets. So if you look at the various sectors, uh, the, the sec- a sector that's been huge, which is that sector, that's at risk now because of a, a variety of things that don't make it look as attractive today. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, just, just to pick up with the rest of the show, so I'm going to tell you what I wanted to do was the next question.
question that's part of that consent for one question and that was that slide for the place that uh, you have to present it at the right time. Just that one comment I was going to make. Somebody else recognized the one question. Or, so, thank you uh, again for being here. I was going to say, hey, I'm sure you're not at the committee. Um, you may have one of those remarks that are talking about the high 50 years uh, from one of the judges here. Okay, if it's a good day, I hear my bill going on. So what I'd like you to look at that to the next 50 years. Uh, and we uh, have the 100th anniversary of this committee. We have uh, our grandkids and our grandkids. Kids get one very nice thing on this committee. Uh, you know, what do you think are going to be some of the profound uh, changes in the way I know this committee has gone and how profound those changes might be? The 50 years, in a sense, is, is a long period of time for all this technology, particularly given that the an accelerated rate of innovation. And so it's not just that we'll think that we have the last 50 years to invent in the same. Uh, the world of water has been far more. And so, you know, you find me quite optimistic, you know, the breakthroughs that will last about energy that's from paper. And uh, in fact, I'm friendly that the latest breakthroughs will come. And in fact, there's many uh, approaches that already can see there's a, a good chance uh, that the advances will be there. The information technology will never be without computers that are very easy to work with and almost so pervasive that you take them for granted will be uh, quite phenomenal. Uh, the breakthroughs in diseases, you know, even in the next 20 years, I, I expect to break to the form uh, the, the major uh, pillars around the world. So, you know, this, this has been a Thank you. 
can probably be trained because I think if we if we train the teachers the right way, they'll be bringing that in to all of the, the different subject matters that they teach. So I tell you, it's back uh, one of the work I know is part of uh, Mr. McCarthy is uh, recognized today. But I'm excited to say that we are our, our last place to be today on the planet. Thank you, Mr. Hughes, for being here with me. I'm glad to see you in the next session. So, it's a it's great to have you here. Michael Giles has more practice with this in the pipeline experience. It's actually the way you're in front of Thank you for working in the education and the work that I've done here at Foundation. And I also represent the UT and the A and the T. Different center of the largest supercomputer was unveiled about two weeks ago. Can we do this on the internet? So we can get some extraordinary uh, technology. Uh, just want to focus on two areas that I know we've covered to some extent, but when I see the uh, students at the University of Texas building the uh, computer chips and everything, uh, and then I found out after they went down some training in India, and then uh, in India, and they went back to where they came from with the training and education, and it worked very profoundly. Uh, that seems to be a failed policy in India, and that's one reason why I co sponsored the Raise the Training Commission of the ASICs. So we'd like to have more of a one time. But we're going to move to the next part today. If you could, and this has been a broad course, but in terms of prioritizing the federal funds, this would be a good one to do for the federal government. Where do we need to be more focused on that money, both from an educational standpoint and from an R&D standpoint? Yeah, I appreciate your points on it. Yeah. 
saved is God and that the great change is God. And that we're going to have to invest a lot to you know, what God has you for this time and this uh, here in this upcoming. Thank you.